What's going on guys? My name is Tommy. Welcome back to the channel. Today our second edition Pathfinder playtest coverage rolls forward. We've got some halflings, we've got some gnomes, we've got a bunch of knee highs running around causing trouble, stealing all our stuff, talking to voles, having furry feet, all that crazy stuff, and we're here to talk about it. Before we dive in, real fast, we've got to shout out our newest patron. As patronage on this channel keeps rising and rising, today, this episode of your Pathfinder 2nd Edition preview content was brought to you in part by Mr. Anthony Campanaro. Anthony, thank you so much for your time and support. It means the world. Now we gotta talk about some little folks. So for this edition of our Pathfinder playtest coverage, we're just gonna dive straight into the meat and potatoes, starting with halflings and here, in fact, is one pictured with his sling, not sling staff. I'm a little disappointed because I wanted to see what that looked like. His cutting people knife, his what we imagine is steak knife, his perhaps hockey stick behind his back. It's hard to say, but I will say I am digging the way this guy looks. Yet again, Paizo, through the cunning use of Wayne Reynolds, continues to deliver. So in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, both halflings and gnomes get eight hit points from their respective ancestries. They're both small and they both have a speed of 20 feet. That means in the core races, it looks like the elves and the goblins with that six hit points from their ancestries will be holding out the bottom end. And it kind of looks like eight is going to be not unlike how our classes are in Pathfinder, the average hit dice we can expect to have across the racial spectrum. Pathfinder 2nd Edition Halflings will have an ability boost to Dexterity and Charisma, with of course one free ability boost to put in whatever score it is they want to, with an ability flaw in their strength, which is exactly what we see in Pathfinder 1st Edition. Again, much like with the Dwarves, much like with the Elves, the ship sails on. In addition, the Halfling begins play, speaking common and yeah, you guessed it, halfling. The next part of the blog talks a little bit about character roll-up, and we'll get there because I know we're all super stoked about that. But first, let's talk about some halfling ancestry feats. The first one mentioned in the blog is called Distracting Shadows, which lets the halfling sneak around by using larger creatures as cover, you know, like your halflings are already doing, sneaking around behind the big Ulfin guy or the orc that's cast Righteous Might on himself. You know, again, the ship sails on. Halflings can also pick up an ancestry feat called Plucky, which helps them overcome fear and other detriments to their emotions. So mind affecting effects and emotion effects, we imagine, as well as the ancestry feat Titan Slinger, to get a bonus to damage when using their slings against large or larger creatures. This bonus increases on critical hits even before it's doubled. And also, hey, to quote Paizo, additionally, the sling is now a more formidable weapon than in Pathfinder 1st Edition. We've both increased its damage and done away with the difference in size between small and medium creatures. Now, of course, I don't think that means our halfling sling is going to be doing 3d6 right out the gate. But if this thing's hitting for a d6 or even a d8, I'll take it because in real life, slings are pretty deadly. In real life, if someone brains you with a rock from about 20 feet away, you're probably on the ground. You're probably, you know, brained to death. And I for one can get behind this. If for no other reason, then this makes a weapon in Pathfinder that I usually stray away from unless I'm in an area where there's just a lot of rocks and I can pick them up and haha, d3 damage. A little bit of a better choice, a little bit more of a viable choice. And again, if all of the weapons in Pathfinder that are subpar come up a little bit in damage and effectiveness in second edition, while still retaining the massive amounts of weapons that exist in Pathfinder for whatever flavor it is that you want, I'm totally on board with it. Now this is gonna sound pretty familiar. Again, quoting Paizo, one feat we know will be popular is Lucky Halfling, which lets you reroll one skill check or saving throw if you fail or critically fail. Notice now there's a difference. Rules in the Pathfinder playtest rulebook list traits that apply to feats, often indicating special rules. This one has the fortune trait, which appears on all sorts of things that involve rerolls and manipulating dice in your favor. You can benefit from fortune only once on a given roll and misfortune can cancel it out. Nevertheless, I really truly believe that one of the most powerful things is the thing that lets you reroll a die because at my tables, if you hit a natural one, it's really bad for you. And in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, if you hit a natural one, it's really bad for you. This prevents that. Even if it's just a once a day, that could be life or death for a character, which makes the halfling seem more of a valid 
play option than it usually does for me because usually I tend to stray away from the smaller races. If nothing else in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, I may be looking at taking some kind of adopted trait on my elf so I can be raised by halflings, strangely enough, and benefit from this. Much like it was for the elves and the dwarves, and hey, if you want to watch our coverage of the elves and the dwarves, follow this card right here. The end of the halfling section of the blog does suggest some backgrounds that might benefit a halfling. Here we see mentioned entertainer, acrobat, street urchin, criminal, and laborer. Again, we don't know what any of these do yet, but we can see that there's going to be a whole lot of them right out the gate. And you imagine as we get like the ultimate backgrounds guide and stuff like that, there's going to be even more. And you guys know what that means, right? That means options. That means customization. That means the thing that we love about Pathfinder First Edition. We've got it right here at character creation. And if there's no prerequisite, no qualifying feature for backgrounds, then a barbarian could take criminal, the fighter could take entertainer, the cleric could take acrobat. In addition to customization, we have a lot of versatility. And again, we see that no two elves, no two barbarians, no two fighters, etc., etc., are created equal, and I love it. So now let's talk about what, to be honest with you, is my least favorite of the core races, perhaps my least favorite of all the races, the gnome. I can't honestly tell you why I've never really liked this race. I've adventured with them. I have very fond memories of a gnome rogue named Mataros, who my elf barbarian Two Moons would start all the encounters with by throwing Mataros to the top of the building, or putting Mataros on his shoulders, or putting Mataros on the rafters so he could crossbow down while I was beating people over the head. But the race has just never really resonated with me. No pun intended for how magic items will work in second edition, but I will admit that I'm reading this all fresh right now. I guess you could call this a reaction video. And I'm gonna go into this with an open mind. I'm gonna go in as neutral as I can, because hey, you never know. First thing we have to see is a picture of a female gnome, I'm guessing ranger, but again, through the use of all the background stuff that we can get in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, really that could be anything. We see her wielding that iconic gnome hooked hammer and a short bow for the big guys, maybe a long bow for her, it's hard to say. What I will say is I like the armor, I like the helmet. It sort of gives me a weird Legend of Zelda vibe, I can't really put my finger on the why of it. I think actually it might be because those big ol' eyebrows on point nut on like the owl from Ocarina of Time. Anyway, let's talk about gnomes in second edition. For a little bit of flavor, because that flavor may very well come into a rules as written mechanical sense in second edition for all we know, a gnome's life is a constant barrage of the curious, the compelling, the cacophonous, the colorful, and the chaotic. There's always something new to discover. There kinda has to be. See, gnomes who don't take in enough novel experience are stricken by the bleaching. Their colorful hair turns white as their minds fall into despair. So let's not do that. Let's explore. This is a thing in Pathfinder 1st Edition. This has been a thing with gnomes since Pathfinder. My question is, is there actually a mechanical thing in Pathfinder 2nd Edition that can cause the gnomes to have the bleaching set into them and what does that do to our ability scores? What does that do to our traits? I have a lot of questions and hopefully they get answered because I'm curious. So again, a gnome will have eight hit points from its ancestry at first level. They get ability boosts to their constitution and charisma, plus again, one free ability boost to anything with a flaw in strength, which again is the same idea from Pathfinder First Edition. Gnomes come in speaking common, gnome, and sylvan and have low light vision. Much like it was in Pathfinder First Edition, gnomes come from the first world, which is the realm where the Fae live. Their ancestry feats can reflect this. Fae Fellowship makes a gnome more charismatic when dealing with Fae. I will say that though I don't really care for gnomes, I love Fae. It's my favorite monster typing. Fae campaigns are super fun and I can get down with that. We also see something known as First World Magic, which gives the gnome a cantrip chosen from a wide number of options, including Dancing Lights, Prestidigitation, and Tanglefoot as in the bag? That's new. We all know what Tanglefoot bags are in Pathfinder 1st Edition, right? The entangled condition that our druids are spamming that's super powerful. Is that a cantrip now? Because if that's a cantrip now, I'll play a gnome. I'll break down. I'll do it. If for no other reason, then we'll wrap some bugbears up in vines and poke them in the nose and laugh at them. Sounds like fun. Gnomes also have access to the ability feat Discerning Smell. 
which lets them truly appreciate peculiar food and drink, or sniff out that invisible orc who's caked in the clay from a particular mountain pass, hasn't bathed in roughly eight years, and recently ate a live bird, again quoting Paizo. We assume this is the scent special ability, and in addition, they get something called animal speaker, so they can talk to all their favorite burrowing animals. If that applies to all the animals, I'm super down because I love druids, I love hunters, I love nature casters, mostly because they can talk to animals and it's easy to get scent through those classes, which is almost as powerful as Blindsight, and I really like having it. Okay, yeah, I'm not even making this up. I am a lot more into gnomes now in 2nd edition than I was in 1st edition because they're getting everything I love about druids, everything I love about hunters, rangers, and they're getting them through ancestry feats so my gnome wizard can have all that stuff. Okay, now that I'm done fangirling about a race that actually I might come around to like, let's talk about some backgrounds that might benefit your gnome to quote Paizo, a gnome's younger years will no doubt be weird, so they could have any kind of background, even a path they abandoned early on. A gnome might be an entertainer, a merchant, a nomad, an animal whisperer, ooh, that sounds fun, a barkeep, or a farmhand. Again, I am super excited for backgrounds. I have no idea what they're going to do. They might be little circumstantial bonuses. They might be something that boosts our ability scores. Regardless, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of customization there because we keep seeing new ones. And I'm really hoping in the next couple weeks we start seeing what backgrounds do in the blogs so I can, you know, like the rest of us, start putting a character together. Hey, so speaking of that, on the subject of putting a character together, Paizo's blog on Friday does shed a little bit of light into how that's going to work. Quote, we've mentioned ability boosts and flaws a few times now. So let's go into more detail about how those work. At first level, your ability scores all start at 10. Your ancestry then gives you ability boosts, each of which increases the score by two. Most ancestries get three ability boosts, I'm smelling human, two of which have to go into specific scores. The remaining free ability boost can go into any score except the two set ones. Most ancestries also get a flaw, I'm gonna guess humans don't, and really this all probably also applies to half-elves and half-orcs, both in terms of the boost and the flaw, which decreases a designated score by two. You can put your free ability boost in the same score as your flaw if you want to, if you want to get back to 10. In later parts of character creation, you'll get more ability boosts, which we'll cover in later blogs, and if you want to roll your ability scores randomly, we have an option for that in the playtest so you can see how it might work, though we prefer for characters used in the playtest to be generated in the standard way. So to me, that sounds a lot like how ability scores are generated in Starfinder. For those of us who aren't in the know, all of our ability scores start at 10. We have 10 points to assign in our ability scores. We get bonuses and negatives from backgrounds and from racial stuff, and it's not a bad way to generate ability scores. I will say though that rolling for stats or using the point buy system has become a pretty big staple at most of my tables, and so too has min-maxing, not only in terms of making dumb optimized characters, but dropping a score I might not need, say my strength or my charisma, to 7, so I can have the extra points to help get my ability scores boosted. In Starfinder, you can drop an ability score below 10, but it doesn't do you any good, you don't buy any extra points. We don't know how that's going to work here in 2nd edition. Time will tell, I'm sure. And also, you know, come to think of it, watching the Glass Cannon podcast cast. A lot of those characters had 18s in the ability scores that they needed to have 18s in. The rogue had 18 dexterity, the goblin alchemist had 18 intelligence, so this style of character generation may serve to level the playing field out a little bit. The people who like to optimize can have their optimized ability scores, but they won't be as glaringly overpowered compared to people who aren't trying to optimize and then later feel they can't keep up with the melee character who's cleaving through everything or the wizard who's spell cleaving through everything. I guess we'll have to see, and hey, don't forget guys, our Pathfinder 2nd Edition Doomsday Dawn giveaway is still going live right now. You guys have between here and the 2nd of July. Get our Patreon up to around 150 bucks a month. At the moment, we sit at 102 bucks a month, so we're really close. Get me to a point where I can take a day off work every week, and I'll run you and five of your fellow subscribers through the Doomsday Dawn Adventure Path, where we can, you know, answer all these questions while at the same time kill a bunch of mummies and prevent an alien invasion. What could possibly go wrong? If you'd like to learn more about that giveaway, follow this card right up here. 
And also, you know, it'd be wrong of us to just forget about Pathfinder First Edition. So we're holding a Pathfinder First Edition send-off tournament giveaway because growth has been so exponentially awesome lately. I need 16 players to get their most brutally optimized Pathfinder First Edition characters together for some good old-fashioned PvP. With a few caveats, no holds barred. I'm talking bring your Aslanti, bring your Drow Nobles, all that crazy stuff. Yeah, there's no better way, in my opinion, to celebrate 10 years of a wonderful game than to kill overpowered characters with other overpowered characters. If you'd like to learn more about that giveaway, follow this card right up here. And as always, our Patreon is in the description. I think I'm going to actually overhaul my Patreon this weekend. Now that we've been a YouTube channel for a little longer, now that I understand what it takes and how it works, things of that nature, I wanna make sure that the channel's goals and the channel's tiers reflect what it is we're doing. So be on the lookout for that for sure. What do you guys think about gnomes and halflings? Do you like them in first edition? Do you, like me, think we might actually be willing to give the gnomes a chance in Pathfinder second edition? And how do you feel about the new roll-up stuff? As always, let me know all about it in the comments below and we'll keep the conversation going. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Our next Pathfinder second edition playtest update drops next Tuesday.